Hey, everybody. I uh, hope you all had a fantastic session B on the deep dives. Um, wanted to invite everyone who's been enjoying having these conversations and wants to keep them going outside of the symposium uh, to join our main XR Access Slack at uh, bit.ly slash XR Access dash Slack. Uh, that link is in general chat right now. Um, because, you know, believe it or not, this stuff still happens the 99% of the year that we're not holding the symposium. So if you want to be a part of those conversations, if you want to be a part of our ongoing projects, uh, please join up and uh, we'd love we'd love to have you. Um, I'll take this moment to remind our moderators to please upload your recordings after you're done. Um, once you close out of Zoom, it'll process and then you can pop them in that folder that we've got set up for you. Uh, and what we're doing right now for the last uh, session of the day here is we're going to have uh, two to three minute takeaways from each of the deep dives. So everyone will get to hear just a little bit of a snippet about um, what all these these fantastic deep dives we're talking about. Um, so we're going to keep it again, try to keep it to two to three minutes each so we can get folks out on time. With that, I will pass it to Joanna to talk about the uh, immersive captions deep dive. Hi, everyone. Uh, so regarding the, the caption section, one of the main topics was how governments could be engaged in regulating the usage of accessibility features, starting uh, on the web and then moving to the XR. Uh, we also discussed uh, logistics of how this could turn into a must do. And the group also pointed out that the government doesn't offer a big number of job positions for the disabled community, and this could be a, a, a great way of starting. Um, second one, uh, we ask if should captions be global to be standardized? Um, and I think it could be a way, but we must remember that VR and AR have multiple use cases. So what applies to an application just for social purposes might not apply to a training one, uh, for example. Uh, regarding the 360 video, this was something that we had uh, on our discussion list when the viewer defines their own viewing area and may not be looking at the source of the sound. Uh, we found that the visual stimulation could be overwhelming for everyone if you manage to access everyone's captions. So uh, we believe the user should have preferences to apply when choosing captions. So I would like, let's say, to have access to uh, the caption immediately after the user have finished or by the end, uh, and to have a menu that you can manipulate directly because one person is one person. Uh, ahead, uh, the topic on how to get emotions out of a conversation was also mentioned. A way could be having some visual signals as an indicator or some, uh, some symbols, for example. And the last topic uh, discussed was also how could we add more pressure on developers to take captions implementation seriously. Of course, this also reports to the CEOs, to the project managers, not only to the developers. And it might be beneficial, we concluded that we might be beneficial to think about these implementations from a project's route. And this was, this was something also discussed uh, uh, during our research on the XR access group, sorry, is something to be born um, accessible. Uh, so I think I covered um, all of what was discussed. So I pass to Corinne Liebel. Thanks so much. Um, so our deep dive focused on the policy implications related to XR. Uh, the panelists were representing the Bipartisan Policy Center and XR Association. And we kicked off by discussing the results of an 18-month study they uh, conducted on the policy implications of XR. Uh, and specifically, we talked through six priorities around privacy, security, economic issues, access and adoption, equity and inclusion, and safety. Um, so in terms of specific topics, one that we really honed in on early on was the digital divide, um, the implications of broadband and inclusion and access. 
And, and specifically, we jumped into the fact that there's a lot of funding for broadband right now federally, but there is not a specific requirement for full accessibility. So a big thing we focused on was how do you get funding allocated from Congress and really how do you get policymakers to understand that this is such an important issue, especially because there is like the big challenge is that XR is still often perceived for gaming. So we talked a lot about message framing, um, you know, inclusive design as a benefit to people of all abilities, uh, the business case. Uh, we talked about technology first, um, which uh, is going on in states such as Tennessee. And these are state initiatives to expand access to technology for people with developmental disabilities. And the goal is uh, to promote independent living as much as possible. The funding is quite limited, and they're really interested in bringing technology into the mix for the client base um, because they, they see virtual reality as being an effective way to reach more people with the funding that they have. Uh, we talked about, you know, what number resonates the most with elected officials, and Miranda Lutz uh, mentioned that uh, based on her experience with uh, working in the congressional offices, she said that job and employment opportunities within the state or district, uh, if you can get that specific data, it's great. She also said that for rural communities, how technology can be leveraged to increase access to education and access to health care, because they are such essential government services. Uh, we had a government statistician, Amy Fong, ask um, just about like research methods and how do you think about what kind of data you're creating and how do you like um, gather the most effective data. So we talked through the diff you know how data needs to be contextualized and you know methods for like connecting outcomes to technology. Uh, we also talked about uh, benefits of XR for DEIA um, initiatives, especially given the executive order at the federal level uh, for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. I uh, talked through um, an example of an LGBTQ community using virtual reality so that they can interact with people, um, especially people who are multiply marginalized. Um, this can be a really um, you know, wonderful um, opportunity to connect with people that you might not be able to connect with locally. Uh, the Office of Disability Employment Policy shared some wonderful knowledge about uh, multi-stakeholder approaches, which we all talk through as being a real priority for developing XR. So, um, and designing standards and frameworks best practices, everything around government policies. So he uh, gathered some great examples um, on some some work they're doing around both autism research and universal design of autonomous vehicles. And finally, we closed with a discussion about the role of government funding for R&D and accessibility. Um, and Larry Goldberg reminded us that the entire history of closed captioning, it was all government funding, Web Accessibility 2 had early funding from NSF. In short, almost all the accessibility of mainstream technology has had government funding. So now, of course, XR needs it too. And with that, I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Corinne. Uh, I'm Mark Steelman, um, and I had the pleasure of leading the deep dive on immersive training, learning, and inspection with Tim Stutz. And in our deep dive, we went over the UI and UX of some of the different Vuforia AR applications that Tim worked on when he was at PTC. So this included talking about inputs and sensory feedback opportunities, the Vuforia Capture and Vantage apps, and the differences between the HoloLens and Magic Leap versions, different menu design considerations with accessibility in mind, keyboard input in AR, which needs a lot more improvement across the industry and is not a easy problem to, to solve. Um, and ways to aid users in navigating 3D spaces with AR content. Um, we then talked about you know, how to assess your XR products, current and future accessibility features with a VPAT, um, which can be especially challenging if your product has a large body of content um, and you might not be able to uh, you know, have someone go through the entire body of content and how do you, you know, deal with those kind of challenges. We also spoke about some of the important 
uh, achievable features app or features that application developers should try to provide, such as controller and input tutorials, input flexibility, captions, accessibility object models to enable things like screen reader compatibility, pausing and playing, skipping and rewinding, and virtual locomotion, which is the way of navigating virtual spaces, um, which could be physical movements or you know, other means like teleportation and joystick movement. And for each of these features, uh, you know, we kind of discuss some of the high-level development architecture considerations that you want to have so that you don't have a lot of extra work down the road as you're building your product to make sure that you can include accessible features. And you really want to make sure that you have these features in mind uh, as early as you can in your product development cycle. Um, and that way, you know, you don't really think of them as, you know, extra accessibility features that require their own budget. They're just features that are going to make your app more usable and accessible. And finally, we ended with some questions for folks to think about after the symposium. So for training and learning applications, how can we tailor experiences to a user's learning ability? How will XR enhancements of vocational jobs improve the hiring process so that people with different levels of abilities can now you know, get jobs that they might not have otherwise been able to get um, before XR technology? How do you think XR training can prolong human involvement in increasingly automated fields? How do we continue to grow uh, as technology evolves? And then lastly, we you know, encourage folks to think about other questions and problems um, and to you know, really continue to be part of the XS, XR Access community so that we can continue to you know, make the future of XR accessible. So yeah, that's what we covered. And uh, now I'll pass it off to uh, Stephanie and Thomas. Hi, thanks, Mark. Um, so I had the pleasure of leading and moderating the non-visual access to immersive content breakout with Roland Dubois and Thomas Logan. Uh, Thomas presented his work on developing VR environments with interfaces for the blind. And his work generally focused on three key areas, which is the object description, where he walked us through kind of how he labeled and, and designed and the methods he used, to, used for object description, the environment and needing to describe that as well as the avatars and he shared the scenarios that he was using to frame these challenges. So if you haven't seen it, his presentation is very good and you can find it on his website. Some of the key thoughts that came out of our discussion after seeing the presentation were that we really need good alt text so that people who are blind are able to select their avatars and don't have to just choose the base avatar because they simply cannot see any of the choices they have. We also talked about object attributes and what needs to be defined in text descriptions are things like the size, the texture, beyond the, the two-dimensional work and into volume, place in the room, the distance from the participant user, and it, does the object interact or respond to the participant or user? So those are new things that need to be discussed when we're talking about three-dimensional and VR um, objects for people who are blind. It was mentioned by one of the participants that there already are games like Swamp, which is a multiplayer uh, zombie game, which uses really robust audio cues to address some of those challenges and that we should be taking a good look at those, investigating and leveraging those uh, audio cues to add to robust feature sets within the solutions we're building. And lastly, it was made clear during our conversation that open source is key to advancing any solutions that are built and a group effort is needed to make these happen. So that concludes our breakout session in our key areas and I'd like to pass it on to Sherry. Hi everyone, that's actually a great transition. Our uh, breakout was about taking research and turning it into practice. We started out by talking about some examples of research projects that have made it into products. Specifically, uh, there were two projects mentioned. 
one from the UW Reality Lab that was adopted by Microsoft and another from UW um, Accessibility work that was adopted by Apple. Um, neither one of these was XR accessibility focused, but nonetheless, we can learn from them. So we talked about what are the ways in which uh, we can promote research to try and um, ensure that more research projects, particularly in XR accessibility, are adopted uh, by other people and turned into practice. So we talked about the importance of open source um, and providing examples um, that are easy for other people to understand of what the technology is doing and what it's capable of. In addition to providing code, um, in open source uh, projects, we also talked about providing data, data sets and also simple demos that help people understand exactly what's going on uh, with the project, with um, what exactly the research contribution is. We also talked about the importance of spreading the word and other ways of disseminating um, the research ideas. Conferences are an important way of doing this and also reaching, being able to reach out through social media. So having organizations be available and approachable through different social media platforms. Um, and another thing we talked about was specific to XR Access. What can XR Access do? to help push XR accessibility research into practice. And one thing that came up in the conversation was potentially offering mini grants to help researchers package their research to make it more appealing to the general public. So possibly through creating websites, short articles, maybe videos. Um, and uh, we thought that that would be very useful for researchers and people in industry. So that pretty much concludes our discussion and uh, I'll pass it off to the next person, next breakout. Thank you. Um, I am Pam Saka from the University of Michigan and our session was titled Designing Accessible and Inclusive XR Enhanced Online Learning Experiences. Um, so within our session, we talked about two main topics. We discussed XR enhanced online teaching and also um, looked into XR research and actually teaching XR. Um, so in the first uh, portion of XR enhanced online teaching, we looked at pedagogical frameworks. Um, we discussed different types of design practices in terms of uh, mapping experiences back to learning outcomes and referring to learner personas and scripting and storyboarding and things like that. Um, we talked about designing XR enhanced learning at scale um, using universal design for learning frameworks um, and also scaling up to the big open online um, learning spaces. We, we talked a little bit about access versus accessibility, so making sure that learners have access to not only equipment, but to internet that might um, be able to handle the things that we're creating. And accessibility in terms of once they're in, is the content, is it a good experience for learners? Um, and for that, we draw on the, the WCAG uh, guidelines. In the, the last portion of our session, um, we had two of our faculty members from the University of Michigan talk about their research in the XR space and their teaching in the XR space. So we looked at accessible uh, mobile AR and the existing functionalities of different AR experiences out there. Um, so one example was verbal descriptions in different kinds of furniture apps for AR. Um, we looked at accessible 360 video. So creating web authoring tools for generating spatial audio descriptions. And the last part was talking about creating tools for designers to author XR experiences. And in this case, we were thinking about instructors as designers. So looking at virtual production stages, um, online synchronous office hours that exist within VR, 
And um, a part that I found fascinating was embedding virtual markers in physical paper. So using XR enhanced paper handouts for classes. Um, so now I would like to welcome Christine to present the next Breakouts Learning. Thank you so much, Pam. It was my absolute pleasure and uh, uh, delight to lead and moderate the session on demystifying immersive innovation. And I did that with Fiona Kilkelly, um, the head of Immersive for Story Futures, Lewis Cannon from Hyperluminal, and Faye Allen, who's the Immersive Developer and Games Designer at Sugar Creative. And really the case study that underpinned this particular conversation was the Immersive Innovation Lab and Accelerator that Story Futures in in-game um, uh, funded and supported or uh, uh, designed uh, that we hosted through April and, and is now continuing into the accelerator now. The really interesting takeaways were kind of summarized into intent, then learning, and then changing that idea to outcome when it comes to innovation. And starting with intent, we had such an amazing cohort of people in the Isn't uh, Miles up next? innovation. Lab. Sorry, I can hear you. Um, the conversation That's in the background. <laughs> Sorry, is he in Skype? I see that he's still here. But just... Sorry, I can hear the conversation. Yeah, he's still, still here. He's using the Google chat as well. I've oh, got it. Um, so you need to start with intent, with positive intent, and the accelerator itself had fabulous positive intent. So all the organisations in the program had been competitive select competitively selected, and that really helped um, bring an amazing cohort together that were able to then learn from each other. Um, in terms of uh, then transitioning that intent to action, we had the four-day lab where it was a really fabulous experience of engagement across the community and from us um, to the community sharing approaches and outcomes, um, you know, uh, different ways of thinking about inclusive innovation to make it easier um, for the organisations to kind of take that step from intent to action within their various uh, creative contents. Some of the things that really came out um, from that, Sugar Creative talked about really challenging assumptions that they had initially of hand-based animation for BSL inclusion into their creative content. They realised through the process the importance of facial expressions and therefore you know, were able to unlearn in order to uh, change the scope of their program. Hyperluminal Games then challenged their assumptions around options and modalities where they were thinking that more options and modalities are better because they provide more, um, more flexibility for people to choose. But actually, they heard through the um, engagement with participants um, and particularly people with the lived experience of disability in the lab that haptic specifically could be quite painful to one of the participants. She'd always preferred the ability to turn off. So optionality isn't just what you can turn on and providing lots of options, but also that ability to moderate or turn things off. And so that really changed what they were doing with their, in, you know, with their designs. In summary, for the learning phase, you know, we have a lovely quote, which was, it was a challenge, but a joyful challenge. So really leaning into that, that learning and just enjoying it. And having tools and approaches were really useful to demystify the how. And then that was really brought to life through engagement with end users around the where, the why, and the what um, could be improved. Um, one of the organisations said at the end of the session that I fundamentally changed the way my company works off the back of this lab. So even quite short learning sessions can change that intent quite um, dramatically into action. Um, and Fiona uh, had a lovely comment, which was, how could you not design XR experiences to be any other way than inclusively once you have this knowledge and approach? And I think that just really shows um, that knowledge and approach, it's not that hard to get, it's just we need to get that out more broadly into community. Once we got to the creating change, um, so how do you actually create change once you've got that this is what we'd like to do, transitioning from an idea to the impact, the key thing that came through really strongly was engagement with end users really made that transition much easier and Hyperluminal particularly talked about how focus group engagement had just really uh, transform their ability to go from that idea to outcome. 
recognising there are really new challenges in deployment when you're in an XR environment. Um, so we talked about both end users, but also intermediary users. And one of the people in the session was talking about how clinicians particularly need to be designed for and how clinicians are not always super tech savvy or have many competing times on uh, demands on their time. So really designing for that intermediary stage is as an important design consideration as designing for end users so that they can then make that, you know, the engagement really inclusive uh, by knowing how to adapt and support the XR for their end users. And then there's new challenges in design. We talked about social VR and how the needs there can really vary. Um, for example, avatars with no face can be quite unsettling to some people, whereas for other people, particularly those on the autism spectrum, had mentioned that having a face and particularly having eyes might feel quite intimidating because it might make them feel at risk of eye contact. Uh, contact. Um, and in fact, we had heard previously that having ears for one particular participant, they'd prefer to not have ears because then they're not feeling at risk of sensory overload from sound. Um, and for Sugar Creative, you know, they mentioned that there's a really new challenge in the work they're doing because they're including a BSL animated character in their narrative to think about where to place it. And that's very similar to some of the considerations that I know we've heard about in XR Access around where do you put captions and how do you manage that in a 3D environment versus a 2D environment. So some of these really new creative challenges that XR um, puts forward. And for final thoughts, um, so much came through from this, but the key one was there's so much positive demand from the sector and it's transitioning that positive demand into positive action by making it easier for people to step through the learning and go from uh, having an idea to implementing that idea more effectively. So good approaches and support, you know, such as lot was offered by this lab and the accelerator, but also such as is offered by the community of XR Access here. Um, and quite a few, it was mentioned a number of times, you know, learning from each other that so many people have different points um, of strength that we can, you know, just being really open. In fact, um, Faye from Sugar Creative's uh, summing, summary point was transparency is the key. So being open about failures as well as successes, collaborating with others such as universities as well, um, and really open communication throughout. From Lewis from Hyperluminal Games, it was the sooner you start considering inclusive design and accessibility, the easier it will be to implement great designs and make better experiences. And from Fiona, really the summary from her was innovation funding and the way it works end to end needs to be reconsidered, whether it's accelerators, public funders, private funders, putting inclusive design considerations right throughout the process from applications and how people can kind of get into the funding support, who's how, how people are selected and considering who will benefit from the inclusion and then the support through a process needs to have that kind of inclusive design consideration right throughout. So that's uh, the summary, commit with intent, be open, connect and collaborate with others, learn as well as unlearn constantly, get creative and engage with the disability community from early on and right throughout to find really great ways to improve experiences in a really innovative way for all. Thank you. I'll pass off to the next summary. Hello there. Hi there. My name is Miles, and I'm from a nonprofit organization called SimSpace, SEMA Space, and we support accessibility and inclusion for deaf and hard of hearing individuals through technology, education, and outreach. Our focus on um, our deep dive today was on inclusion, um, an inclusive hackathon, and what an inclusive hackathon would look like. We discussed the challenges, what accessibility barriers there are currently for the hackathon event, potential barriers of people that disability, people with disabilities have faced in order to get involved. So we have no disability representatives there, and so many of the projects developed, um, developed from the hackathon, they're not considering accessibility. 
and so that just perpetuates um, that industry not being accessible. And so that's a continuous barrier. We discussed experiencing what XR needs in order to be able to partner with um, Might, sorry, Mighty Hack, I believe it said. There are things that we can improve on, like setting a better standard, a set guidelines. Making sure that we have specific targeted access, um, like an access coordinator role. People to be able to plan between um, access being coordinated early enough to be able to promote and saying what accessibility they're able to provide at your event and promote that from the get go. Also testing your accessibility tools and platforms. Find what potential barriers there are for access there. Um, do they support captions with video feeds, et cetera? Provide motivation, incentives, awards, um, and kudos for what accessibility related projects they do have. If the hackathon events have already been set up and there's experienced barriers for access and inclusion for deaf people or other people with disabilities, why don't we take a step back and realize that, hmm, maybe we can create a disability-led focus group um, or a disability-led hackathon. And we have proposed that idea on what that could potentially look like. If disabled people were to lead the hackathon event, what would that look like? Being sure that we have disability representatives in leadership roles. And from having them there from the beginning will ensure that the event will align with all various accessible needs. We could design the hack itself to support a disability focused goal or a project and we would give them a specific accessible task or need that they need to fill. I've done the work, we need people on the floor rolling up their sleeves and getting creative with accessibility. Again, in roles such as leadership, developers, designers, mentors, we need to make sure that we have people that are disabled in those roles. Remember, there's nothing about us without us. Testing and experimenting various, various levels and platforms um, of software, maybe hosting an event online, in person, may have different accessible needs compared to a virtual event. I'm discussing through examples of AltSpace, the VR system, being able to support live captioning within AltSpace. Mozilla Hub is an app that does currently support, um, it's run in your browser, or you can have it on your Oculus Lens. Uh, you have multiple options, so that may be able to help with assistive technology. We have set up a committee where we have an ongoing discussion there. We want to cr uh, create a bigger vision of setting an inclusive heart. Um, and you can find that committee. Um, it's in the main XR access um, for the Slack channel. It's the public gene, it's different than the symposium. Um, you can also see it on the website, it's in Slack. And the channel is called hashtag H-S-T-H-O-N, hackathon. So if we successfully, uh, successfully set up an inclusive hackathon in our vision, we'd be happy to spotlight. And we're going to spotlight some examples um, at other events in the future. So maybe people who are inexperienced with accessibility 
we decided that we want to go ahead and design a disabled led um, and fully inclusive event and we'll propose that shortly. Okay, that's everything from me. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Ashley Coffee Now. Thank you so much, Miles. This is Ashley Coffee. I am a white woman with long brown blondish hair coming at you from my home office in Oklahoma. And my pronouns are she, her. I am the Emerging Technologies Lead at the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technologies, also known as PEAT. And our mission is to foster collaborations in the technology space that build inclusive places for people with disabilities. Our vision is a future where new and emerging technologies are accessible to the workforce by design. My co-lead, Madeline Acrosti, we lead the Business Case XR Workstream, and we facilitated an exciting discussion today. Our deep dive topic was around inclusive, immersive meetings and collaboration. We discussed how to make immersive meetings and collaborations more inclusive by leveraging Pete's inclusive XR and hybrid work toolkit. In hybrid workplaces, immersive meetings can really help employees stay connected in meaningful ways, regardless of geographical location. By using XR tools, employees can meet you in a virtual space and feel as though they're in the same room. You need to make sure that everyone can participate equally in these meetings. This means that in addition to procuring accessible XR technologies, you must plan and conduct immersive meetings with accessibility in mind. We discussed seven, seven different ways to make your immersive meetings more accessible to every employee. And these seven ways come from the Pete XR and Hybrid Work Toolkit, Section 5. The first thing you can do is plan and set up your meeting. If you're the host, you should contact participants well in advance of your meeting to ask if anyone requires a specific accommodation. You should also clearly share what accessibility features will be included in the meeting by default. Hosts should make sure that participants with sensory, physical, and cognitive disabilities can access any software that is integrated into hardware devices and is used and set up in the meeting. Now, the second area here is entering an immersive space. We discussed what you can do to make it a more inclusive meeting when you're entering an immersive space. Participants that are entering the meeting with disabilities should be able to understand the virtual or physical space where the meeting is taking place. For example, they should be able to learn the space's size, features, and immediate surroundings. Participants with disabilities should be able to understand the relative position of their body in a virtual or physical space. Third, when interacting with other participants, participants with disabilities should be able to understand how many people are involved in or attending the meeting. When it comes to sharing accessible documents and materials, you should consider sharing those materials in advance. And when it comes to communicating in different ways, captioning of spoken dialogue should be available for all participants. This will ensure all participants that cannot hear or speak or who prefer captions can fully participate. And when it comes to communicating in different languages, hosts should check if their immersive meeting application supports multiple spoken or written languages. And lastly, 
when it comes to recording and getting transcripts, hosts should check if the immersive application offers a way to record conversations and receive affirmative consent from all employees. And hosts should check if the application provides a running transcript of conversations of participants, including speaker attribution, and the transcript should autom automatically summarize or hand-typed captions to be downloadable for use after the meetings. So to bring this all together, the seven areas that you can make your inclusive meetings more inclusive in XR are seeking in advance for planning up and setting up your meeting. Think about entering your immersive space. Think about interacting with other participants. Think about sharing accessible documents and materials in advance and in different format. Consider communicating in different ways. Consider communicating in different languages. And lastly, consider recording and getting transcripts of your conversation. Thank you to all the participants that contributed to this lively discussion of inclusive immersive meetings. And if anyone has questions or would like to read more about the PEAT XR and Hybrid Work Toolkit, you can find it at peatworks.org. That is P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S. And I will pass it along to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. This is Monique Morrow, and I had the pleasure um, co-moderating uh, the session, the deep dive session on building inclusive XR systems. Um, this is uh, with my colleague, Mathana, who goes by the pronoun they, them. And Mathana and I are actually uh, co-chairs of the um, Ethics and X, uh, X Extended Reality group with the IEEE. And so what did we talk about here? We talked about different points of what are ethics. We talked about um, accessibility from, um, for example, the user perspective, the developer perspective. Important um, topics to think about uh, to stimulate the discussion is, for example, avoiding what uh, is called ableist design, invisible disabilities, and sensory awareness. Uh, active, promoting active inclusion. And also uh, contemplating the issues around uh, harassment, privacy, and consensual encounters in extended reality. One of the points we have to um, discuss, uh, which is what do we mean by ethics? Uh, what, is, what is ethics? It's highly contextual. Um, and we actually, for example, um, broke it down into pre, uh, three main areas. Uh, ethics as a socio-technological code. Um, some see ethics as a sort of um, human and machine code that underpins, for example, systems operations. Number two, ethics as a human choice. Uh, the comment here is systems that uh, give uh, people the opportunity to choose uh, thresholds of system interactions that adhere to their virtues. And number three, Ethics as a societal value. Um, ethics can also be seen here as an extension of socio-cultural values into digital design. We have suggestions based upon um, paper uh, that was published uh, in our IEEE Global uh, Initiative. And this was actually authored by uh, Dylan Fox himself which is around visual accessibility. That is um, altering the size of objects and elements and text, um, audio augmentation and text to, to speech, for example, and providing color filters and symbols. 
Uh, number two, mobility disabilities, setting uh, uh, menu options, and controller-free uh, head tracking, hand tracking rather, hand tracking. Uh, number um, four is dynamic um, foveated rendering and eye tracking. Eye tracking and foveated rendering techniques um, developers, for example, can use to increase accessibility, including um, the following uh, interface, providing interface navigation, um, providing input selection, providing automatic scrolling, uh, providing aim assistance, providing object selection, providing text and fine details re for rendering quality, and providing analytics and user research. There's also the, uh, what was also captured in our discussion was deaf and hard of hearing in extended reality and ethics and building systems, captioning, providing captioning audio features, um, using icons to identify audio features, and what is important and has been um, integrated here in our conference is providing sign language. And then, of course, um, controller-free tracking. We uh, hit a little bit on cognitive disabilities. Um, we talked about mobility disabilities. Uh, those with cognitive disabilities may want to save their settings and preferences for uh, the future use of the platform that becomes built in this uh, area. And we have absolutely have a call to action because we have a corpus of work uh, in this space uh, through the IEEE uh, organization, uh, through our, I our organization in terms of providing extended reality and ethics. And that is uh, really looking at uh, all of the papers that we have published in this particular area. We would love for you to become active in our community and especially looking at uh, more in the extended reality XR ethics of diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. And I want to thank you very much and thank uh, our participants in the discussion. And now I'd like to hand over to uh, Chris Lambert. Greetings and hello. Today we had a deep dive on intersectional equity in XR. And considering equity at the intersections of ability, gender, race, class, sexual orientation, and more when designing and implementing XR. I was co-moderated with Dr. Valerie Jones-Taylor, an associate professor in the Department of Psychology and Africana Studies at Lehigh University. We're also joined in concert with Albert Kim, of accessibility next gen. We went beneath the surface to talk about when we look at design and we think about ecologically the XR ecosystem, XR meaning extended reality. On the subject of accessibility, how can we access the metaverse if we don't know what it is? And on the other side of accessibility is when I find myself at the threshold and into the entry of the metaverse, with what device am I about to use if I am part of the disability community? Is this device that I'm going to attempt to use to get into the metaverse, was it made for someone like them, or was it also made a consideration for someone like me? We also talk about accessibility of design. When we ingress into a hyper-realistic immersive simulated environment, 
or a standard immersive simulated environment, we automatically begin to educate ourselves, we may say through perceptual science, of the environment that we find ourselves in, consciously or unconsciously. Knowing that extended reality isn't only visual, to only say that extended reality is visual is a single variable equation. It's not a single variable equation. It's a multivariable equation. Knowing that when we deal with full immersive spatial computing, that we're dealing with sight, we're dealing with sound, feel, touch, taste, which taps into environmental fidelity, cognitive fidelity, spatial fidelity, intentional and unintentional fidelity. One of the great points that Dr. Taylor made, based on a question that Dr. Say asked, he asked about when we go into these immersive environments, what of captioning? What of the language barriers? From his experience, he sees that it's majority English. Dr. Taylor had expressed that our product delivery teams and our builders and developers we need more people that are in those rooms beyond your designers and developers that are bringing cultural cross barriers of cultural communication, intercultural development, and that are contributing to the cultural narrative. Because when we talk about XR design and extending our reality, none of us wants to go and ingress into an environment that's completely foreign to us. We want to go where there's cultural identification. It may speak to the adage that you want to hire the people that you want to buy your products. Albert brought a fascinating point that there are organizations outside of corporations and startups that are dedicated diligently and steadfast, in which he shared in Slack, and you should be able to find the link as well, to different groups that are dedicated towards closing the gap and holding attention to the need for greater accessibility to the metaverse and in the metaverse. Now, we also talked about the seven standards of the metaverse, which is humanity first, first, second, accessibility, third, education, fourth, equality, fifth, community development, sixth, safety and privacy, and seventh, wellness. But let me say this. As one of the key takeaways, that if we can't access the metaverse and we can't enter into the metaverse, we will have no metaverse. It's one of the reasons why I architect the seven standards of the metaverse and put accessibility as one of the most highest urgency and important things that we must deal with. So this conference that we're here at today, these deep dives that we've attended, they couldn't be more important as we become more virtual in the past 26 months than we have the past 26 years. And with this summit, what we are really doing are helping them access the metaverse for thousands of communities and to bring in millions of people safely, humanely. I urge everyone to take a look at the recordings that we held for our deep dive and all the other ones that have been present and expressed thus far. We look forward to continuing this conversation. A tip of the hat to our good friends at XR Access here from Gatherverse. My name is Christopher Lafayette, and it's been a pleasure to be able to explore with you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. And I think I say for everyone here, that was a fantastic summary. Thank you so much for that perspective, Christopher. And hello, everyone. My name is Ricardo Gonzalez. Uh, first of all, a quick note before I share my summary. I would like to say that Pia Zaragoza, the host of the for the demystifying funding opportunities for inclusive XR research. Um, won't be able to come, uh, but we would like to acknowledge her work. So thank you so much, Pia. We are happy that you moderated this deep dive for the XR Access. 
Um, so, uh, um, so I am Ricardo Gonzalez and I led the research networking and collaboration deep dive session. So our deep dive session focused more on specifically addressing three pressing problems. Number one, understanding how can we improve and promote collaborations between researchers and industry. Number two, what are the barriers for newcomers coming into XR research in general, in terms of funding and also knowledge gathering? And three, what can XR Access can do to get more people involved and you know, excited for this important field that we are all working on. So I would like to focus on two specific things, on the barriers for newcomers and for what the XR Access Network can do. But I encourage everyone to maybe take a look into the recording to see what we discuss and what can you do as a member of the XR ne Network to help uh, make this successful. So for barriers, first of all, we need to keep pushing forward and advocate for the inclusion of accessible authoring tools in development platforms. Uh, I think I say this for everyone. Uh, it's absolutely essential to be able to have uh, members of the, dis the disabled community being able to contribute directly with the products, not just as a idea maker, but more like them directly being able to have input in the things that are getting out there. Number two, making uh, more uh, easier for new developers to gain knowledge on how to make basic accessible uh, needs met on these applications in a very similar way to how the web standard works. Uh, we need development platforms like Unity, uh, Unreal to have more resources for these newcomers so that people can get up to speed and create applications where we can start generating insights and knowledge on uh, how can we tackle these accessibility barriers. And number three for barriers, we as a community, we have to make a better effort at integrating newcomers because uh, one of our uh, participants mentioned that they had tried to make an effort to email, find mentors, uh, call email, but and I know that we are all occupied and some of us are doing this work as volunteers, but we have to make sure that we attend to these people so that we have more allies and we can get more people involved. And now um, for the, what can the XR Access do to build up this community? We are looking into maybe hosting more informal social events they can be local, they can be at conferences, so that researchers and other people in adjacent fields can get more involved and connect and collaborate early on, because there's also a very big problem in the research community that many times researchers work in the same exact problem, and then uh, we are basically almost competing with, with each other. And number two, have the XR Access members to be more, uh, to be ambassadors of the organization, to actively share more of the research insights and maybe create more um, digestible content that can be shared in social media networks. But yeah, um, again, I encourage everyone to go see the recording, contact us, contact Shiri Asenkot, uh, the co-founder of the XR Access, uh, uh, and also uh, leader of the XR Access Research Network. 
uh, with ideas. And with without further ado, I pass it on to Dylan Fox and thank you. Thank everyone for coming here today. Awesome. Thank you, Ricardo. And thanks so much to all of our moderators. Um, we know this was uh, a lot of logistics and a lot of documents and slacks and all kinds of things to get this together. So thank you for sticking through it and uh, enabling these great conversations. Um, just want to remind you one more time to upload those recordings because all of the recordings of our deep dives uh, will be made available on the XR Access Symposium website uh, in the coming weeks as soon as we can upload them and verify their accessibility. Um, also, would love to remind everyone to please uh, join us on our main XR Access Slack, uh, bit.ly slash XR Access dash Slack um, to, to keep being a part of this conversation, right? You know, we're not going to make progress on this. We only talk about it once a year and then come back the next year and, and wonder what's happened. It's going to take a lot of effort from all of us uh, to, to keep persevering and keep pushing on all fronts um, like we have done today. So with that, I am going to go ahead and pass it to Jesse to close out the 2022 XR Access Symposium. Thank you, Dylan. I'd like to echo everything that you've just said um, with a huge thank you to our deep dive moderators and reporters for leading us through these discussions today and to each and every one of you for joining us, for offering your ideas, your lived experiences, and your know-how. Um, I'm already seeing the seeds of new collaborations emerging, um, and I am so excited to watch these grow in the future. Um, yeah, so we at XR Access would like to help you keep this energy going throughout the year. Um, as Dylan mentioned, we hope that you'll all join us in our main Slack channel, which you can find at bit.ly slash XR Access dash Slack. So please head over there and introduce yourselves um, and keep up these conversations, meet new people and help us create a flourishing community around the <laughs> challenges and joys of making XR accessible. We also have several other events coming up, including research network seminars, which will take place on the third Tuesday of each month at 12 p.m. Eastern, as well as even more upcoming community and industry speakers and another quarterly showcase in the fall. And we welcome all of you to attend these events. And finally, please keep in touch and keep telling us how we can best make an impact on XR accessibility. All of our most impactful work is done in collaboration with our community of users, of advocates, developers, designers, researchers, business leaders, and all of you. And we'd like to support your project ideas, your research, and your collaborations. Um, we'd like to hear about your accessibility, XR accessibility stories, which you can tell us at xraccess.org slash stories. And if your organization, your company, nonprofit, or university would like to commit to XR accessibility on a deeper level, we would welcome you as consortium members as well. We would also very much appreciate your feedback on how we can make this event better going forward. Um, you will receive a post-event survey link via email. Your responses to this survey help us make future XR access events more useful, more accessible, and more fun for everyone who attends. So I'd like to close out with a final thank you to our sponsors, Yahoo, Cornell Tech, and the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, to our supporters, Verizon and Google, to the members of our BCXR Workstream who presented today, and to all of the deep dive moderators, and to everyone who helped organize and support this event, and to you, all of you who have attended over the past two incredible days. You are why we do what we do, and we could not do it without you. You help us grow, you help us make an impact. And so thank you. And whether it's online, in person, or maybe one day even in XR, we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you.